this week on the Back Table Podcast. For there to be IO researchers and experts who are doing some of the molecular and immunologic work that they're doing is just a testament to where we are as a community. You know, that we have the skill set in our space where people can do that and run those labs. And we have to continue to kind of like advocate in that, invest in that where we can develop those people, you know, in terms of research and other things. Because a lot of that is going to find its way into our clinical practice in five to 10 years. And if we're not investing in it and demonstrating the value and supporting it and honoring it, then we have to be sort of doing that in addition to sort of sharing all the other educational elements. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable MSK podcast, your source for all things musculoskeletal. You can find all previous episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Stryker's interventional spine business offers the control you need, the flexibility you want, and the quality your patients deserve. Stryker is your partner in making healthcare better. From technology to training, from reimbursement tools to patient education, Stryker is there to support you every step of the way. Innovation is the driving force at Stryker. Their extensive product portfolio for vertebral augmentation and radiofrequency ablation procedures ensures that you have the tools needed to provide top-notch care. But their commitment to advancement doesn't stop there. With recent additions like the Optoblate Bone Tumor Ablation System, and FDA 510K clearance for the spine jack system for compression fractures that result from malignant lesions, myeloma, or osteolytic metastasis, you'll be eager to explore all the solutions Stryker has to offer. Learn more at www.strikerivs.com. Now, back to the show. Hey everyone, Jacob Fleming here. I'm starting off this episode a little bit differently than normal for a couple of reasons. First of all, the recording of the beginning of this episode got messed up and I'm having to re-record this introduction. And the difference in audio is a little bit apparent based on the difference in the microphones used to record. Secondly, this was a special episode recorded on site at the SIO 2024 annual meeting in Long Beach at the end of January. And while this is far from the first time Backtable has done an on-site interview, this year, we're going to be at a handful of these meetings this spring, including ASSR, SIR, and the ESNR Hands-On Interventional Spine course in Sicily. And in regards to that event, I've had the opportunity to participate with Dr. Luigi Manfrey in a series of promotional podcasts for that course. We will share those with you and hope that many of you will consider going to this world-class training course. Uh, it's a fantastic experience and there is a discount for fellows. So please check out those links in the show notes because the tickets are going fast. And if it's just not in the cards this year, well, there's always next year. And until then, Backtable has you covered, starting off now with SIO President Mudib Ahmed at SIO 2024 talking interventional oncology state of the art. So uh, I'm Mudib Ahmed, I'm the current president of the Society of Interventional Oncology. Um, in my real world job or professional job, I'm the chief of interventional radiology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center uh, in Boston as well. So. And fantastic. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us. And this is a big year, it seems like, for SIO. And uh, I've had the privilege of kind of watching this evolve over the last few years and, and during my short career so far to the point that uh, as a medical student, I was back at the WCIO meeting, kind of proceeding yeah. what we now know today as SIO. And I've seen uh, year after year the, the interest and the momentum pick up. But just being here today, before the, uh, even the first official day of the conference, it seems clear to me this is, a, this is a banner year for SIO and for interventional oncology in general. And so, like I said, uh, the conference doesn't start in earnest until tomorrow, but today things have started explosively with the IO Essentials Program, a uh, fantastic program for uh, students, residents, and fellows. And I was just speaking to uh, Jenna Everly Sack, the amazing executive director for SIO. She let me know that uh, the attendance here is 120 scholars, growth of more than 60% from last year. Uh, so the excitement is palpable. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts kind of on the maturation of IO and the, the massive interest from trainees going into it. Yeah. So um, 
speaking as someone who also grew up within the S, uh, WCIO kind of framework, um, going to meetings uh, when I was training and in my early career, uh, I would agree it's just been a fantastic kind of development of the sort of subspecialty of interventional oncology. And the SIO is maybe sort of the flagship society, in my view, that um, is really advancing the field. And, you know, part of that is to be really thoughtful about those types of things and activities that need to be developed. And one of those is education, training, and a core component of that is training early career, you know, individuals. And we're sort of traveling in parallel to the development of IRDR training and a focused IR training. And so it's sort of, I think all of these things in our specialty work really well together. And so we are focusing on bringing in, you know, residents and fellows so that they can get that exposure to interventional oncology, which is going to be a core part of their practice, hopefully in the future and really gearing early training. And this year, as you kind of noted, you know, 60% growth year on year is fantastic. I mean, it really just speaks to the demand and the interest in the, you know, in the early education community. So we're like heavily committed on investing in that group of people. Absolutely. It's great to see. I really love to see the commitment uh, in terms of the future trainees coming in and thinking back again to my days, even as a med student going to the conferences, you know, I can, I can look back to some of those sessions I went to at SIR, WCIO as being uh, sort of seminal events for me. So I, I really am, am just really impressed to see how that's going. And, and aside from the education at the uh, student and trainee level, SIO has really made a, a big effort over the last uh, couple years to expand the educational offerings to practicing physicians. And so uh, we've seen uh, the MSK masterclass debut really, really blow up in the last couple years. I had the chance to go uh, last year in San Diego, just a fantastic experience and, and someone who's uh, very invested in that field. I can look back to SIR 2018 when a uh, session that I attended just opened my mind to the realm of possibilities. And yet th this is always something that's kind of on the vanguard. And so we see this in IO a lot. Things are just morphing in so many directions. And so uh, I really have to congratulate SIO for taking such incentive to get the education out there to make that happen. And one of the big things that's happening at this meeting is the first breast cryoablation masterclass. This is something that I've heard a lot of interest about, not just from interventional radiologists, but some of the breast radiologists I've talked to uh, locally as well. So this is a really exciting development. And uh, with the commitment from SIO, I think that we'll probably start to see this really start to disseminate uh, across the country and, and really throughout the world. Just a sidebar, uh, it's always fun to be at this meeting because it's such an international thing. We have international experts here. But uh, talking about breast cryo in specific, uh, how has this focus kind of come about? And just tell us a little bit about the current state of breast cryo. Yeah. So, you know, maybe to take a, a high level view, the concept I think that we have been advocating for in the, let's say, last five or six years has been around the masterclass concept. And that really, for us, you know, people use that term maybe widely and everyone, it means something different to everybody. But to us and, and to me, it means that we are really trying to train people to be able to do an actual technique, you know, from the beginning, seeing a patient, evaluate who needs it, perform it, uh, follow up those patients, really the true clinical sort of global um, approach. And when I was maybe younger, I would go to conferences and you see people, you know, talk about different techniques. But a lot of times it's really challenging to leave the room and go and implement that. And so how do you sort of like teach someone in a way that they get the information they need, plus the exposure to the technology and other sort of elements so that when they go back to wherever they are, maybe with um, a minimal amount of support, they can actually start offering that type of care. And the MSK masterclass was sort of maybe the first one that really we did in the SIO five, six years ago, where we wanted to teach that. And you partner with industry and you really teach the hands-on components so that people can learn that. And you know we have obviously developed that, but now we're expanding into other areas. And I think what we, you know, one of our maybe core principles of the SIO is what does the community need? What is upcoming? Where, you know, what are what is at both the frontier, but sufficiently mature enough that people are going to start to see this in clinical practice? And then how do we sort of build a core, you know, focused program so that people can come and learn about it? Mm -hmm. And in a way that, again, teaches them, you know, 80, 90% of what they need to know, 
um, so that they can go out and uh, and be aware of that. And and breast cryoablation as a as a methodology is really starting to reach its maturation. Mm -hmm. Been around for you know 10, 20 years, perhaps longer. We heard about that in some of the sessions today. But really, there are some good studies that are developing and coming through now. Um, the ICE three study had reported, I think, in the last year or two years, it's three year interim data, which was excellent. It's longer term data is going to be coming out. So we know that the the clinical space is maturing. So now the question is, how do we teach people to do it so that it becomes available to patients? And patient access is a critical part of you know our specialty to make sure that patients have access to people who can do that. And in breast cryoablation, we're not you know interventional radiologists are not going to be the only people in this space you know because those patients are seen by breast radiologists they might be seen by breast surgeons and so we want to teach high level we want to teach our community how to do it really well we want to partner with other communities where uh, we can share some of those patients uh, and the breast cryoablation class today is a great example where we partnered with the society of breast imaging uh, and so in our sort of master class today I would say about how they asked this question at the beginning of who is uh, an interventional radiologist, who is a breast imager, and it's probably half and half in there. Oh, that's impressive. And that's, I think that's a great sign because the SIO, you know, if I were to say philosophically, the SIO wants to be the place that people come for their IO mm -hmm. education. And it doesn't always matter that you're an interventional radiologist or you're a breast imager. Some, in some instances, you might be a surgeon. You might be a neurointerventionalist and some, you know, so how do we bring all those people together to ensure that everyone is practicing at the highest level where there's collaboration, where we're advancing the data and the science. And if we're really good at what we do, we'll be at the forefront of that. And, you know, and so that's sort of maybe what drove this particular class is that it is maturing. And in particular, it just reflects a really great collaborative partnership that I think is a little bit unique. Absolutely. And as, as you were talking about that, I was just in my head is collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And IO inherently of its nature is that way is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. And one thing that I really like about the meeting in general is there are a lot of sessions talking about parallel developments in uh, you know, things that are a little bit outside directly the IO wheelhouse, talking about immuno-oncology, where of course there's there's starting to be some very interesting overlap with IO. But talking about, you know, where where does medical oncology fit in? Where does uh, surgery, radiation oncology, these are things that as interventional oncologists, we need to be uh, acutely aware of in order to be able to expertly explain and offer the care uh, that we're capable of and expand the access to that. And, and speaking of the expanded access, one of the things I'm really uh, looking forward to is the private practice and community symposium uh, at the tail end of the conference. So this is the first of its kind. And uh, if, if I had to guess, I think the um, reception is going to be uh, very excited for this because, of course, there's, there's this kind of a natural dissemination of techniques and care over the years, and things tend to start off in the, uh, the so-called ivory towers, the tertiary academic uh, centers where, uh, where we train and where, of course, you work. And yet, uh, from, from the time that I uh, got to see some of these things as a med student, uh, I, I really started looking for those those patients during my training who are the patients who really need this and they are just everywhere and falling through the cracks and so expanding to the community level just seems to me just a really crucial thing to do so i can't wait for this i'd like to hear uh, a little bit about the impetus for this of course these things don't just kind of uh, fall together it takes a lot of uh, dedicated uh, energy from many people uh, to make these events happen so Kind of what was the impetus from from the society to get this going? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll take a minute and just um, when we talk about people who kind of have been driving this, Dr. V.J. Ramalingam is the program chair this year, and really I think gets a lot, if not you know, a huge huge amount of credit to developing the program and really making it very innovative and interesting, and and both on the breast cryoablation side, which he led, but um, even in this. Uh, many other elements, but also the private practice one as well. And, you know, again, I think philosophically, we want to have, I sort of look at this as a, a, a big tent philosophy. We want as many people as possible to come to the SAO for their education. I think we have to acknowledge that in, you know, if we're interventional radiologists, many people are doing IO treatments as part of their practice, but not all of their practice. Mm -hmm. And so 
there, you know, we have to sort of continue to help provide education for those people who might do IO only a handful of cases uh, in any given month, um, not just uh, at academic centers where people may specialize and do, you know, much larger amounts of IO. And so that was a big driver of really identifying and acknowledging that interventional oncology therapies to be accessible to patients need to be offered by everybody that has the skill set. And many of those practitioners are going to be in private practice settings. They're going to be in OBLs. And so that's, you know, how do we sort of bring those people in, offer education and training that meets their needs, not what we think they should be taught, but what they actually need. And that is a different, those are different things. And, and I think we have to acknowledge that just like we bring in experts to talk about breast ablation or MSK interventions, those are people who do that and who have that experience. You have to bring in people who are doing IO in the private practice setting to understand what those challenges are that are going to be unique to those practices. How do people learn to offer new therapies? How do they make it uh, viable for their practices? Um, how do they sort of um, navigate the nuance of you know, let's say credentialing or equipment access or coding and billing and other things. So th there's a lot of very specific challenges in addition to the clinical element. And so I think that's, you know, where we're coming from is that we want to sort of be able to to develop and offer that and acknowledge the needs. And, you know, the, there's been recent publications around um, the presence of IRs across, let's say, the United States, uh, as an example. And and th there are large geographic areas where there are not as many IRs. There's, I think the, the number is maybe a 11 or 12% of counties in the U.S. have an IR. So like there's a real patient access problem. And so we have to make, you know, this type of education available to everybody in a way that patients get access to care. And, and I'm definitely a firm believer. I, you know, we have a robust training program. Many, uh, if not all my residents and fellows are going out into the real world and practicing and they're not practicing at you know, necessarily only those really large well known academic centers. And I want to prepare them to practice and offer the best possible care as my sort of ambassadors and proteges and other things. And so, you know, I think this is just a natural need. And, and that's kind of where the SIO is. It still falls very well within our, our band or our philosophy of, you know, it's just a different cohort of people. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I really appreciate seeing that covered as well as, you know, more of the uh, really groundbreaking, bleeding edge uh, technologies and therapies that we see at the conference. And and we get to see, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of international world experts come in. And uh, of course, our, our friends, uh, Alexis and Demetrius from from Greece and the esteemed professor Thierry Debert giving the keynote uh, lecture tomorrow. It's always so so rewarding to see from uh, across the pond and across the world how things are coming together in a parallel fashion. So it makes IO really an exciting uh, thing to be a part of, and uh, especially as a trainee, you know, which uh, the, the IO Essentials program really kind of continues throughout the course of, of the conference and uh, gives gives that view. And then, of course, we have these larger sessions that. Um, are for the practicing physicians and then the community symposium as well. So I really do applaud the SIO for covering all those bases. It's very difficult to do. And so again, you know, I, I hear this refrain over and over again. Oh yeah, IO stuff. Oh yeah, that cool, crazy IO stuff. Yeah, you'll only be doing that if you're in an academic position. And I, I, I always say that could not be further from the truth, but figuring how to get it to ground level and expand it out, it's a, it's a major issue the access to care issues as as you raised, I think these are going to be some of the bigger problems that we're going to face as a specialty and as a society. So really excited to see those tools uh, being dispersed. Yeah, I think that's, um, it has to be part of our community's mission to make things available. And part of that is distilling out what people need to know and whether they, it's a technical you know element or it's cognitive and, and knowledge-based, we have to sort of continue to really make it easily available. I think, you know, we, uh, you sort of called out some of the, the global um, leaders as well. And the SIO has its origin as the World Conference on Interventional Oncology and has multiple international pioneers, you know, among its ranks and in its uh, sort of legacy of leaders. Uh, and we're continuing to sort of build that out. And I think one of the things that we're particularly proud of in the last several years is, is building out chapters in different regions of the, the world. 
Uh, we have an Asia Oceanic chapter that partners with multiple societies there also to sort of, with the idea that we are want to offer education, even in those spaces where maybe not everyone is doing all I all the time and they need some focused education and partnership. I think there are opportunities for developing those as research areas as well. Um, and then we are in the process of developing a, a LATAM, a Latin American chapter as well, uh, and partnering with the Brazilian Society, Sprici, and uh, City. And so I think kind of continuing to build that sort of philosophy of, you know, having as many people have access to IO in its various forms, whether it's education, whether it's, you know, in advancing research, I think is going to be key. And many of these places actually have challenges that are different from ours, right? I mean, in terms of how, whether the technology is available, whether, you know, the, how those patients are seen, whether the disease days are different. And so I think it's just going to be a great opportunity to continue to, to partner uh, across, you know, globally across many of these places. And, you know, there are innovative IO leaders everywhere. And, you know, I have as much to learn from any of them and to see what they're doing in a way and partnering on research and other things. Uh, so we're excited to have um, them be a part of our society. Absolutely. It's great to see the cross-pollination here. And, and speaking of research, uh, SIO really at its core is a scientific meeting. So some very impressive uh, research and cutting edge therapies being shown. What are some of the things you were most excited to hear talked about at the meeting? Yeah, there's a, um, there's a couple. Uh, I think we are definitely, um, as a society, trying to advance research within the specialty. Um, and uh, I'm sure you, you'll see and hear about um, the acclaimed study, which is the SIO, you know, is, is actually running a trial on colorectal ablation uh, in the liver and using margin confirmation software. And I think that's maybe one of our sort of points of pride at this meeting is that we started that study up and we have multiple sites and we're accruing patients and, and it's an exciting thing for society to do. Um, but there's a lot of additional you know, through our preclinical grants program, and there's going to be some presentations in that space as well. There's a lot of really interesting work being done around, you know, the immunology of IO, the changes that happen in tumors at a molecular level, and trying to understand that so that we can sort of really figure out how, you know, where IO lives and how we can combine it with immunotherapies and other things um, uh, as a way to really offer the best possible outcomes. And so it's, there's a, like a, a, a really interesting spread in terms of the types of uh, science that's going to be presented. And I think that kind of brackets it really well because the molecular, for there to be IO researchers and experts who are doing some of the molecular and immunologic work that they're doing, is just a testament to where we are as a community, you know, that we have the skill set in our space where people can do that and run those labs. And we have to continue to kind of like advocate in that, invest in that where we can develop those people you know, in terms of research and other things, because a lot of that is going to find its way into our clinical practice in five to 10 years. And if we're not investing in it and uh, and demonstrating the value and supporting it and honoring it, then, then we have to be sort of doing that in addition to sort of sharing all the other educational elements. Absolutely. I uh, couldn't, couldn't have said that any better. And uh, speaking of the advancement of uh, clinical care and being on the forefront, Dr. Jennings and I spoke uh, momentarily recently about the uh, appearance of uh, robotics and interventional oncology. To me, this is something that's really exciting. I personally haven't had any experience with it just yet, but this is just one of those things you say, yeah, that's going to be the future. And so uh, luckily, of course, we'll get to uh, see some of that during this meeting. W what are your thoughts about the advancement of robotics and IO? Yeah, robotics is an interesting space because we're sort of seeing how that's played out and developed in surgical, in, in cancer surgery, surgical oncology. Uh, and how it's sort of seen a proliferation in terms of um, the types of cancers it's used for and how surgeons are applying that. And we're seeing a little bit of the co-optation of some of that technology or techniques into IR in terms of image guidance, um, needle guidance. And uh, and I think it's going to be interesting to see maybe how all of these technologies really come together. Because we have actually maybe several pieces that are traveling in parallel, mm -hmm. image guidance, image fusion. Yes. Uh, is one. And because we're using a lot of advanced imaging, the ability to sort of incorporate it into IR rooms and other things is is sort of developing. And then there's the question of like true robotics, so arms and advancement of needle and other things. And there's a couple different companies that are developing that. I think we haven't quite seen exactly where it'll go because there's some of them are co-opting surgical technology specifically. And so it's going to need to be right-sized for IR procedures. Figuring out what are the optimal procedures that it makes sense for is important. There's, uh, I think, a, a few companies out there that might be looking at sort of endovascular kind of manipulation or guidance, you know, 
wire control, for example. And um, I think we're going to, so there's, you know, a difference between cross-sectional robotics versus endovascular robotics. Those are all going to need to be continued to be developed to find the, you know, in my mind, it's finding the right first two or three sets of cases that make sense mm -hmm. that we can then sort of build off of. So as, you know, if we use the surgical robotics analogy, you know, finding one or two cases where it's clear, we can show some benefit, we can show the difference between use of robotics and not, you know, lack of use for a clinical outcome is going to be important. Uh, I think one of the challenges that we're going to face, particularly within the U.S., but I would say probably elsewhere as well, is how does that get, how does one handle the cost of that? Right. You know, and so one of the sort of maybe examples is if you use a robot to do a biopsy, uh, just a CT-guided biopsy itself is not structured in a way in terms of uh, the financial reimbursement that covers the cost of the robot. Right. So really one has to sort of do in parallel to the development of the technology, those studies that show clinical efficacy to understand like, oh, it's actually worth doing it this way. Mm -hmm. And then making sure that the the work on the back end in terms of uh, reimbursement and other things compensate for the cost. And that's not a new thing in interventional radiology because new technology always costs a lot. And then, but it is a barrier to proliferation. Yes. Uh, and then you get back to things like patient access and other things as well. And so, so it, I'm curious, like you are, to see where this goes, because I, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of potential and development is going to be fueled by you kind of finding the right fit. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot that we can learn from our surgical colleagues where uh, general bariatric surgery, urology, there's been um, a real proliferation of robotics to the point that, I mean, most modern training programs, the residents are getting significant experience with this. Of course, uh, and aside from that, we've talked about this a few times on the show that sometimes over-reliance on these techniques can, can create a new generation who's maybe uh, not capable of doing the, the more uh, utilitarian approach. So I think this is going to be really interesting to see how this plays out in the next five to 10 years. I'm sure uh, at SIO, I, SIO then things will look even more drastically different from today than today is from WCIO in uh, 2016. Yeah, so right. <laughs> I think it'll be really exciting to see. And so, Doctor Ahmed, that's really all I had uh, to talk about. Any other thoughts you'd like to share? No, I, I appreciate your time and the opportunity to talk about the SIO. I'm just extremely excited and honored to be involved in the society and. You know, for me, it's uh, a privilege to provide, you know, my time for this. I think it's it's a really valuable sort of a space and the work that's being done is, I think, really going to be great to advance the field. And I would encourage any and all who are interested in the society to volunteer and to join, you know, the success of this for our community. We're helping ourselves and our patients. And, you know, there's always opportunities for more people that are engaged to volunteer um, at all levels. And so I would just maybe end by... by asking people to join and let us know if they want to be involved and we will always find things for you know volunteers and people to do because this is a this is a partnership fantastic absolutely and on that note do want to thank you on behalf of the entire society and the rest of the specialty just countless hours of work that you uh, have put in as volunteer yourself as president and all the president elect leading up to that so thank you i, I hope you really get to enjoy the conference and uh celebrate going out with a with a bang on that <laughs> well actually i have a year left so. okay well so, um, on that note yeah. we will see you next year <laughs> and we will reiterate that the thought at that time <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, awesome well thank you so much dr Ahmed. this is a real pleasure cool. and uh to everyone listening uh, i'm sorry you can't make it but uh, definitely put this on your calendar for next year sio 2025 and we'll catch you on the next episode. And Thanks. it'll be in Las Vegas next year. Las Vegas. You, Better heard, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll see you there. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable MSK on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Jacob Fleming, and co-hosts Michael Barraza and Chris Beck. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. 
Social media and show notes written by Marvi Espiritu and Anne Dang. Administrative support provided by Jun Roy Thanks again and see you next time.